Trump at McDonald's. He's working at McDonald's because Kamala said that she'd worked at McDonald's and it turned out that she's a liar, but everybody knew she's a liar. So Trump made a spectacle of her lie and the left lost their minds. It's actually quite funny. So we'll have a look at that. Um, Canada is a net exporter of fentanyl. Yay, we're exporting something new and not LNG. So, ha. New Brunswick's election is today. Holy cow, that snuck up on us. I'd been watching about the liberals and I didn't think they were that much of a threat because Higgs seems mostly sane, although there were things that happened that were not great. Did he do the grocery store ban or is that just Houston? Was it Houston who did that? I think it was Houston who did it and not Higgs, but I could be wrong about that. Regardless, there's an election today and it's not a dead cert that Higgs is going to win. So, uh, well, get out and vote if you're interested in that. Although I think the votes are rigged. So I think the only reason Higgs is in danger is because he's going against the gender ideology and the powers that be don't like that. So Calgary moving forward with city building plan that nobody wants, the 15 minute cities and all the rest of it. And so how can they move forward with this when nobody wants it? Well, they, they don't actually work for us. That's why. That's the, that's the reason, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I were wrong, but it does not seem to be so. Cuba has no power. Now, this happened a few days ago, and I'd missed it. And even after two days of no power, it really hadn't penetrated the interwebs. We talked about it yesterday on the Kitchen Table Talk I posted, but um, I hadn't heard much about it. And at day three, and now maybe day four if they haven't fixed up the uh, power plants yet, but that's a lot of days. And the reason is it's communist down there and they were not upkeeping the plants properly and they didn't have people trained properly and it just kind of all broke. And I guess they don't know how to fix it. So we'll see what happens there. But how much does it take to overthrow a communist government? Sometimes having the entire uh, Electri electronic grid, electricity grid go down, that'll do it, right? Maybe sometimes. Elon Musk kidnapped SEALs for the US government. Why? To test them about their resiliency of sonic booms. Weird, weird. Lots to get to. Let's get to it. Really, we're going to start with the BC election because there's more to examine there, but we have to start with this weird story first. So Elon Musk says the regulators made us kidnap SEALs twice. So crazy. This is so weird. Like This is the kind of thing that you would expect to see in a grocery store lineup right beside the National World News or the Weekly World News or something to that effect, right? Right beside the, are you team Brangelina or team Benefer? I can't remember which teams they were. Regardless, right by the trash magazines, right? Were these other trash magazines, but this one's real. And so Mario says, the US government forced SpaceX to kidnap baby seals for compliance experiment. In the ongoing saga, of stupid government regulation, SpaceX was once forced to kidnap a seal and subject it to a strange experiment as part of a regulatory com uh, of regulatory compliance. <laughs> Concerns over how the sonic booms from Starship launches might affect seals near the Vandenberg site led SpaceX to strap a seal to a board, put headphones on it, and play sonic booms sounds to monitor its distress levels. <laughs> the experiment was conducted twice, and the seals reportedly stayed calm during both tests. Source: uh, Teekton YouTube. So weird. Weird. That whole thing is weird. I have nothing else to say about that, but it's really strange. Also, it's weird that the Canadian government has like a regular seal hunt, the seal clubbing thing. And like, that's all weird. The weird stuff around seals. Okay, there's lots to get to around BC elections. So let's talk about that. Cosman says, I turned on the CBC News BC election coverage. And of course, they're still calling conservatives, anti-vaxxers, racists, and internet trolls. The, oop, I didn't mean to do that. Huh. The media Media's dedication to doing the NDP's dirty work even after the polls close is unreal. Ah, the, the polls aren't closed yet. They're still trying to make this um, election rigging palatable to the general public because Rustad didn't lose, okay? Rustad didn't lose. This is software called Scorecard and Hammer or Hammer and Scorecard. But one thing I wanted to say about this, this doesn't look like a Canadian news network. You can't see the whole thing. This looks like a foreign news network. It does not look like a Canadian news network that I've ever seen before. There's a couple of lighter skinned people, I guess, but what what's going on here, right? Like why are we not allowed to have people who look like us tell us the news? Seems really strange, right? When that seems to be really important for everybody who's not white, right? Like very weird. Anyway, Tracy says, I don't understand what's taking so long. Elections BC says the initial count is incomplete. Final count is scheduled for October 26th to 28th. Now we've known this already, but the initial count is still incomplete. So it looks like the NDP have inched uh, ahead of the um, conservatives for the 46th seat and controlling seat, but we'll see. And who, how long this whole thing lasts, 
who knows, lion advocacy said, so it's going to take a BC one week to announce the winners of its provincial election, considering BC is the hotbed for Canada's foreign interference and treasonous MPs problem. All BC polling stations should be overseen ASAP by one, Canadian Armed Forces, two, the RCMP, three, Federation of Law Societies. You know, like, I don't trust the Canadian Armed Forces to oversee our elections because I feel like our armed forces have been systemically uh, swept of anybody who would stand in the way of this woke ideology rampaging through the Canadian Armed Forces. And the ev there's evidence of that everywhere. Um, the RCMP, well, s the modern RCMP are a joke. And I, like from Brenda Lucky to everything they've done since, I, don't, I can't point to one positive thing they've done. In fact, I think probably they deserve to be investigated themselves for playing cover for treasonous MPs in the Liberal Party. So I don't have any kind of, like, th that doesn't help me. Like, overseen by the Canadian, the woke Canadian Armed Forces and the treasonous RCMP? Yeah, I'll pass that. The Federation of Law Societies, I guess so, but I'd have to look into them a bit. So um, I think that, well, if we had paper ballots and... Uh, Patriots, somebody who cares about the integrity of the whole election, et cetera, et cetera, overseeing things would be better. But at this point in time, I think like everything is just cooked. Like I don't think there's anything that's above board at this point in time. And I think that the people are so brainwashed. There was a free speech debate in Oxford. I was reading about it this morning. And the back and forth debate, you can watch the whole YouTube video. I haven't watched it yet. But ultimately the students voted it was about mandating vaccines and ultimately the students voted to mandate the vaccines after the whole debate and everything and i was like crazy why would they do that and it seems they're ideologically captured and brainwashed to the point of stupidity so i don't i can't come to another conclusion right like vaccine mandates are directly in violation of personal individual choice personal responsibility all the rest of that like and they're very harmful, very harmful. Did you not pay attention to what just happened? And even so, in the face of all that, they say, I, we choose for your safety, comrade, right? And so pff, that's scary stuff. Here is Hammer and Scorecard, and this is from 2020. And if you look now, if you Google it now, the first page of Google is full of debunking, right? Is Hammer and Scorecard real? Hammer and Scorecard not real? It is Hammer and Scorecard where CIA software packages developed by the CIA and brought and made public by the Obama administration during the Obama years to have an un well to have a lot of power in South America they unleashed it in South America and like as f I was talking about it yesterday on the kitchen table talk and I said as far as I understand this is well known as far as I understand people know about this and now I realize that people think this is a hoax or fake or something like that as far as I understand it this is as real as it gets there's a Stuxnet Stuxnet there's a, a piece of software meant to go after nuclear turbines and it makes the nuclear turbine after a long enough period of time, like poisonous basically. And it doesn't work anymore. It'll, it'll wreck everything about everything. And so like, that's, it's weird and it's real. And the Americans did it to counter Iran. I think it was Iran. Um, and it was targeting like nuclear, uh, something the centrifuges used to enhance or enrich the uranium and like the whole point was to derail their ability to do that that was real as well Ma uh, rachel maddow was talking about it in 2009 um, i digress hammer and scorecard are cia programs designed to intervene in foreign elections uh, being used in the u.s now and it says hammer and scorecard are the names of two programs designed by the CIA to interfere in foreign elections, and now allegedly they're being used in the United States as well. And then Lieutenant General Lee McHenry, General McHenry describes them as a pair of programs initially designed for the CIA before being privatized by deep state players from the Obama administration. We explained how they work in an article last week, but the gist is this, the hammer or the hammer is a counterintelligence surveillance program used to spy on activities on protected networks, such as voting machines without detection, while scorecard is a vote manipulation application that changes the votes during transfer. Here's the, here's the least detectable form of election manipulation because it works during data transfer between voting stations and data storage hubs. Unless both sides are looking for irregularities, it's impossible to catch. If nefarious forces had people on one side or the other, or both data during, uh, during data transfer, it cannot be exposed. Um, 
Voting alterations are limited to something like 3% in each move to make it less obvious. CIA programs known as Scorecard allow its users to change voting outcomes by hacking into the transfers between local reporting stations and state or national data centers. According to McHenry, it's a small amount under 3% to keep it from triggering any alarms. He would know he served in top military positions under the, the Secretary of Defense and the Vice President of the United States. Now, the problem with Scorecard and Hammer is that you, you can't reconcile before the votes done because in order to keep it undetectable they can only flip a small number so if you have say it's trump biden okay and say uh trump gets so many votes that three percent flip to biden is not going to change it doesn't matter right and so while that helps keep trump uh, from running away with it but he did run away with it anyway while the three percent flip per transfer helps I, th I heard they even doubled it to six percent but i digress that's a conspiracy theory um but all of that helps, but they need time afterwards to know the number they have to beat. And so they had to add the the pipe burst. They had to stop the count because they had to know the number they had to beat. Then they injected the, um, the false ballots after that to bring it up to the number they had to beat. That's the problem with Hammer's scorecard. You, ha you don't know how many you need. You can just flip a small number. And the whole point of Hammer and scorecard is to make it look close, make it look unbelievably close, right? And you put your person in. Gov.exe says, BC election results projected the NDP to pull ahead of the Conservatives party by one seat. Is anyone shocked by this? I'm not, because Hammer and Scorecard are in play, and this is exactly what it's designed to do. And if they could get Rustad off there, they probably would, but I guess they can't, right? Like, the whole point is to have your party in power, but, I mean, they're going to have a hard time with this, the way this is set up, because... Uh, the BC's NDP have 46 seats, Rustad has 45 seats, even in, like, it seems like this is... Well, I guess it could flip. There are 19 seats in play according to the official results, although I don't know if that's still true. Um, there were 19 seats in play at the end of the election. I don't know if those 19 seats have firmed up. I know there's recounts in at least three seats, so those um, those three may be the only ones left. Okay, well, it says elected in 42, 42 there, so it's a dead tie, <laughs> and Greens too, and leading four for the NDP and three for the Conservatives, so... It, it could be 46, 45 still. Um, but Rustad has said, and I'll show you in a video, that he's going to he's going to bring the government down as fast as possible. Linda Blade says, by any standard, what John Rustad and colleagues in the conservative BC party have achieved is nothing short of legendary. From, 12, or from two seats to 45 plus in less than two years, it's remarkable to consider the ground game required in the short time frame to find candidates and teams surrounding each in all ridings across British Columbia, plus the establishment of a solid slate of common sense issues that now place this new conservative party in a virtual tie for leadership of such a super woke Canadian in province. Honestly, yep. The need for a, re a recount over the next week is evidence that the blue wave has happened and in BC and will be happening across Canada. One more time for the record, I post the chart showing the crazy blue trend line. So very rare in politics to witness such an extreme ascension. So yeah, I mean, right, like right up to the top. So that's very, very interesting how quickly that happened. Here's Rustad. He says, if we're in a situation where um, there's a minority government, we'll bring it down. Here we go. And I'll say this right now, that if we have the unfortunate situation of David Eby being in a, uh, a minority government, he will not do a single thing that he has promised. And that is something I'm almost guaranteed in risk. The Conservative Party of British Columbia, if we're in that situation, we are going to make it as difficult as possible for the CDP to do any more destruction of this process. We need the same in Ontario. We need to fire the whole school board, the whole everything, everything attached to the school board, done, gone. See you later. Same with uh, healthcare, education, healthcare, and then withhold the taxes from the federal government and say, and if they don't satisfy the demands of make us believe that there are no Chinese traders running the government, then those taxes get refunded to the constituents. I'll never collect them. I'll never collect them. We'll collect them when they prove it. So anyway, we'll have it. We'll have a government a provincial stopgap that doesn't allow the federal government to steal our money and send it to Ukraine anymore. And we'll get rid of the healthcare nonsense and we'll get rid of the education nonsense. We need to do it. We need to. The only, who's gonna, who else is going to do it? Nobody else. Nobody's going to stand up and do this. So, I mean, we need to. Rustad is one person who's done it. And he thanks his wife. There's a longer clip. He says, my wife talked me into it. Um, at the end of this, he calls calls his wife on and, and I'll play it. I'll play it when we get to that. Um, 
But he's saying, I'll make it impossible for these people to destroy this province anymore. Kirk says, what an incredibly close BC election. Wow, we will know final results on October 28th, and there's a chance that there will be another election right away. The conservatives have done so well, and everyone should be proud of their work. Could they have done better and campaigned better? Sure. But look at this map. We have too many Canadians who just have no ambitions to having a better community, uh, a better country. NDP got voted in the areas with some of the highest homeless, tent-filled areas, crime and drugs everywhere, pure irrational. Those people are activists. They vote, they double vote, they take advantage of, of loopholes. And the only reason that those places voted NDP, I feel, is election rigging and interference. Um, so yeah, and I wanted clarification on what he meant by an election right away, but I think Restad provided that. Like he said very clearly that given the opportunity, we'll bring this government down in the first chance. So there you go. And he'll make it impossible for them to do anything. So that's also good. Son of a Bench says, Dave Eby confirms he's looking to form a coalition coalition with his NDP and the BC Green Party, calling his conversation with Green the Green leaders, Sonia F., a partnership. So that's interesting, trying to hold on to power. And that's the... Somebody said that's the NDP's backup plan and was the NDP's backup plan all along. Could be true. Start, uh, Stat Cloud says elections BC estimates that approximately 49,000 ballots are still to be counted and will be part of the final count on October 26th to 28th. And somebody says, how is this possible? Canu says, how is this possible? Election uh, Electronic counting, 49,000 mail-in ballots. Uh, Stat Cloud says it's just the rules. Any mail-in ballots received after advanced voting closes could not be counted until the final count day. This is consistent with previous years. In fact, in 2017, there were over 170,000 ballots still to be counted at the final count. Seems like a lot in tight race. Why can't they be counted today? Asks Can You. And Stat, count, Stat Cloud says, all mail ballots received after close of advanced voting need to be sent to the election BC headquarters in Victoria, where the final count will occur. This is so each ballot can be verified to ensure that vote Voters were eligible, only voted once, and that the ballot was filed, filled out properly. It's a very intensive process that undergoes a lot of scrutiny since any irregularities will likely be challenged. Again, I'm not like using, in 2020, they had sophisticated vote flipping software that was virtually undetectable unless you had people at one side or the other or both. And so I'm not very... Um, if something looks odd and gets challenged, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get to the bottom of that irregularity. And if it's flipped, I don't know that we're going to know for sure. And within a year, the Google or whatever, the search engines will be turned to say, oh, any talk of flipping elections is wrong because blah, 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 blah. And they'll come up with some very plausible something or other. Um, Odessa says, hey, CBC, why did you cut out the end of the BC conservative John Rustad's speech on your digital YouTube channel? You waited over four hours at the back of the room just to get the speech, but cut it off as soon as he brought his wife on stage for the most touching part of the speech. Is it because it would cancel your fake narrative that conservatives are misogynists? So he brings his wife up at about 10 minutes and he says, she's the only reason I'm doing this. So here we go. We won that riding, and so I just uh, a huge thank you to Nathan Giddy and the whole team uh, up in the Chaco Lakes for the work that they did. And last, I want to call my wife up here. Kim, come up and join me on the stage. Kim has been an incredible rock for me, supporting me the whole way through. And a matter of fact, I wouldn't be doing this here if Kim hadn't actually talked me into this. She really did an incredible thing. She pushed hard. She said, you know what? If you're not going to stand up and do this, who will? And she pushed hard to say, it's time we need to do this. We need as a family to do this sacrifice, to do this work. And I'm very proud of Kim and the work that she's done and the support. It's just, it's been absolutely incredible. So Kim, I love you, sweetie. Thank you so much for everything. See, if that was Tim Walsh, he would have given his, his wife a firm handshake. Okay. Good job, Mr. Rustad. Um, here is a, I, don't, I think this is a, an analyst, Cat Canada sharing this. Analyst says BC election so close that lawyers might get involved. <clears throat> he says the ballots might need to be hand counted, <gasps> right? Uh, because people won't want to rely on Dominion voting machines. Who would want to rely on Dominion voting machines? I think he means the electronic tabulators. They aren't voting machines. They're Dominion 
electronic tabulators. They're essentially voting machines. Here we go. It's around 50 seats. So, um, you know, there's going to be a subject. I mean, this is so close. Lawyers are going to get involved. I mean, there's going to be, I would imagine, hand recounting. People aren't just going to rely on Dominion voting machines. They're going to be like, let's hand recount those ballots uh, and because uh, it's that close. So People like me would say that. The people who have the 3% um, add-on for the Dominion machines, they're going to want to use the Dominion machines. I think that a lot of people understand how this whole thing works, and they're going to say, listen, we'd like to do it just the same way we did it the first time because you know we won that way. Brittany says, the wokest place in Canada used Dominion voting machines, and now we need a recount by hand. Uh-huh. Yep, that's exactly what happened, and it's going to happen again and again and again. Rebel says it's going to take one week to announce the winner of the provincial election, considering BC is the hotbed for Canada's foreign interference and treasonous MP problem. All BC polling stations should be overseen as soon as possible. Oh, and this is the same essential tweet as uh, Lion Advocacy had, so that's kind of funny. Um, and again, my my issues with the institutions that we have are, are well documented, so I'll leave it. Real Robert says, here it is, Dominion emails confirm, this is in the US, but this maps in Canada. Forensic experts testify under oath that the electronic or the election system in Ginwet County, Gwinnett County, Georgia, was also remotely accessed from Belgrade, Serbia, by Serbian nationals during the November third, twenty twenty election, including Michigan, Colorado, and other states. The Department of Justice doesn't investigate election fraud; it only investigates arrests and prosecuted prosecutes evidence of election fraud. Um, so it it's not actually they're not. I think they protect the people who are perpetrating the election fraud personally. Uh, Rex is responding to National Newswatch. National Newswatch says, election BC confirms recounts in two writings. Official result will take another week. So yay. Tell me again why nobody trusts elections anymore. A week to get results. What are we? Uh, a backwater banana republic with no internet or technology? Soon. Soon. Josh is sharing this. Georgia, Pennsylvania, and now Tennessee have become the latest states to report instances of election fraud, including Dominion voting systems allegedly flip, flipping votes. That's what they're designed to do. Hammer scorecard. Shadow of Ezra says Dominion voting systems have issued a threatening tweet warning Americans to stay silent about their alleged election fraud practices. The company claims that any uh, that they are monitoring individuals and are ready to take legal action against those who speak out. Will you stay silent? Uh, I'm not very good at that. DC Drano says, isn't it wild how voting machine companies threatening, threatening the American people if we criticize them, but only if it has the opposite effect, or but it only has the opposite effect. We distrust these machines even more. We will scrutinize election fraud even harder. Yeah, yeah. I hope that's fruitful. It seems like it's not so fruitful. Like it seems like we're not doing a good job at, at doing that because BC is locked in this. I mean, in order to fix it, I think we're probably heading to another election in BC pretty quick, like Christmas, January, maybe, if it lasts that long, we'll see. And Rustad's saying like he doesn't want it to last that long. If the Green and the uh, BC NDP have a coalition, how do you think the people are going to handle that? Like, do you think the people are going to be okay with that or no? Seems dicey. Holly Doan says, Western Free Trade Farm Group's petition Senate CA to reject Bloc Quebecois bill on dairy quotes. Bloc leader Francois, Yves Francois Blanchet, uh, warns C-282 must be signed into law by October 28th or he'll bring down the government. So this is, a hey, Senate, get things done. So it sounds like Trudeau is doing his work through the Bloc leader there. Here's David Aiken. He says, as one veteran liberal told me this afternoon, it's starting to look like a stampede for the exit. So lots of MPs and cabinet ministers are leaving the Liberal Party and they're not going to be running again. We're up to six, he says. I don't want to play it because David Aiken is a whiny baby man. So I'm just going to carry on. But he, he counts the number of MPs and cabinet ministers who have left, uh, two in Seamus O'Regan and another one, and then another four yesterday. And so that's that's quite a lot. And so cabinet shuffle in, incoming, but really we should just have an election. So, But it still won't solve it because we won't know who are the Chinese traders, right? Shucks darn. And says, Anne's responding to National Newswatch. National Newswatch says, Pierre Polyev says he wants provinces to overhaul their disabilities program and he could withhold federal money to make it happen. Um, and here's, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. 
Here's a quote from the article. For those roughly a million Canadians with disabilities who do work, we need to reform the benefit program to reward that work. Right now, there are clawbacks if you're a person on disability and you get a job. So instead of punishing people who get a job, they want to reward that and not necessarily claw back the benefits, but reward the, the work. So I'm interested to see what reforms he's going to bring forward. And we'll see, I guess. Danielle Smith. Oh, man, Danielle Smith. What's your game, Danielle Smith? Alberta's success, she says, is built by its people. Oh, that's nice. Especially skilled news newcomers. <sighs> At the Premier's Summit on Fairness for Newcomers, we discussed how talented individuals face challenges using their skills here. That's why our government is cutting red tape and working with partners to recognize foreign credentials faster. Together, we're building a future where every newcomer has the opportunity to thrive and contribute to Alberta's growth. Yay. What's your game, Danielle Smith? I mean, why can't you celebrate... Albertans' contribution to Canada, Albertans' contribution to Alberta. Why do you have to go into this niche of newcomers? And I'm not meaning to be, like I started the show talking about how CBC looks like a network of newcomers. And it's just very odd and notable to see your country's demographic change in real time like that and to have people pandering to foreigners over citizens at every turn, people who are paid by taxpayers, the CBC, they're all paid by taxpayers. And so they're preoccupied with um, hiring non-white people. And then Danielle Smith's preoccupied with making sure newcomers feel at home. Meanwhile, like Canadian citizens who've paid taxes for all their lives are being ousted from their homes because they can't afford the property taxes. And we're just going to ignore that because that doesn't fit the narrative. And it seems it seems very gauche. I don't like it at all. It seems it seems wrong. And Danielle Smith, I mean, she hasn't said anything about the Coots guys. She hasn't said anything about Archer Pulaski. She hasn't said anything about anything. And she pretends like she's she's doing what you know people want. It's like it's Doug Ford in Alberta. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. CTV News is reporting this. Alberta UCP to vote on celebrating CO2 and abandoning net zero targets. Oh, we should have a CO2 holiday. That would be great. Like, yay, let's celebrate carbon dioxide. Yay, we love carbon dioxide. Um, I don't think most Canadians would go for that because the brainwashing is very, very deep at this point in time. But And I thought to myself, interesting, like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of pushback in that headline. I wonder when the pushback starts. A proposal to stop labeling carbon dioxide as a pollutant and instead celebrate it as a foundational nutrient for all life on earth will be up for debate at the UCP annual general meeting in November. That's November 2nd. Um, the resolution, which includes abandoning Alberta's net zero targets, flies in the face of scientific consensus that carbon dioxide emissions created by humans burning fossil fuels is one of the primary drivers of global warming. The increased temperatures in turn cause more frequent and extreme weathers like wildfires, floods, heat waves, and storms and droughts. So um, they're saying, and nature has been purchased by people who are ideologically aligned with the climate changes happening and we need to fight it and blah, 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 all this stuff. So right away, they're already trying to say that climate change is a thing and anybody who doesn't believe it in it is you know, wrong and bad and misinformed and you know, should be educated more, et cetera, et cetera. And that's nonsense, absolute nonsense. The climate hoax is being used to steal tax dollars. But I also said, and here's here's why, this is the, goodness, there's a lot of tabs today. There's a lot of, um, I was watching a weather modification video and I, yesterday I shared it. I think it's at the beginning of this, here, this one. So this one was okay, but I did, it wasn't that great. This one here, which is in today's links, is really, really interesting. And it's got, he does the first, five minutes, six minutes, is this historic um, footage talking about that they want to melt Antarctica. They want to melt the ice in Antarctica in order to influence the weather in the world. And they're not sure what that's exactly going to do. But this is historical footage talking about that. Into the North Pacific. What the consequences of these changed distributions of ocean temperature might be on the weather itself. We think that in the computer, we could simulate a great change like this. We could, for example, if we wanted, wipe away the Rocky Mountains. Uh, in, in the computer model. Uh, wipe them off the surface of the earth and see what the weather would be like without them there. If we were able to develop a mathematical model to perform realistic experiments, to, to do weather modification experiments there safely before they're done uh, on the real world. 
because Antarctica is like not the real world. So now, uh, so the last 10 minutes of the video is this guy going through what Antarctica looks like now. So you can see on Google Earth, if you go to Google Earth, there's all this ice and snow, but that's not the live the live footage. You have to scroll in for the live one. Oh. And when you scroll in, oh, uh, he's, go. he's going away from it. When you all scroll right, in, it's not, that. hold on, I'll show you. There's a better, there's a better version. Here he is explaining it. Here we go. There's a sea of ice, but when you zoom in to where you see a live shot, there is no ice. It is open corridor. Have these mad scientists accomplished their mission? I don't understand these people's theory of an ice wall, which they have melted the ice in Antarctica. In my opinion, these mountains only have a light dusting of snow. Massive encampment. Put on Street View, which they actually have here. And look at the technology that they melt the ice caps with. These atmospheric heaters are all over the planet, northern and southern hemispheres. At northern North America, these things are all the way across Alaska. Okay, so there is much more going on than we are uh, we are aware of at this point in time, in my opinion. And so it's very, very interesting what's going on. Back back to finish our election series. Bradshaw says, New Brunswick election today. Let's see how the CBC will insult the people of New Brunswick. If you don't vote how CBC wants you to vote, let's go blue and make CBC lose their minds. So uh, some people were telling me, oh, you know, Higgs, I don't know if he's going to win. I hope he wins, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'll let you know tomorrow or next week, depending on count, I guess. Nick, let's talk. Hello everyone, thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to canadapoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.